I'll share this. Community. I'll share it for our streamers. With peace, harmony, and unity, we honor the land that which we stand on as Treaty 6 territory. This is sacred land to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, and our particular neighbors, Hall First Nation, Enoch Cree Nation, Alexis Nakoda Sioux Nation, Alexander Cree Nation, and our friends of the Métis Nation. We recognize and acknowledge indigenous values, traditional teachings, ways of being, contributions, and historical inequalities. We respect all cultures with an open heart and an open mind. We all heal together. Apologies, Chair. We seem to be having trouble with the sound. Testing one, two, can you hear this or is Lorraine just really quiet? Yeah. We can hear you, Jordy. Okay, and I will test the mic there as well, please. Oh. Oh. Okay, I'm hearing I'm not clear. Okay, we'll try a different microphone. How about now? Can you hear this one? Online participants? Testing, can you hear me now? So we can hear you through the mic system in the room, but it's not um, it's not as clear as it was 
in previous meetings, and so I'm not sure why that would be. Okay, I'm not sure either, but we will work on it as we go ahead, and I will try and speak um, speak clearly. The thing that we'll have to watch for is when anyone else's microphone is on, is that clear, and I can you hear that, so we will watch for that as well. Okay, thank you. I'm back to my National Cookie Cutter Week, December 1st to 7th. And as we reflect on how we make decisions and what our conversations and questions signify, let's reflect on the fact that education is not a cookie cutter approach. All students are unique. We all come with our own skills and talents and treasures and challenges. A moment in reflection, please. Thank you. We will move on to 1.4 on the agenda. Trustee announcements. Are there any announcements from trustees, please? Seeing none in the room and none on the screen. Um, I do have two. One of them relates to the Interact Club at Memorial Concert High School. So the Stone Plain Rotary Interact Club um, functions or operates out at Memorial Concert High School. That's the students are under the auspices of Rotary Club. And they received kudos and commendations from the Kinsman Club of Stony Plain for their work and organization on the Christmas Hamburg campaign and on the Red Kettle campaign. campaign. So they volunteered a number of hours on both those campaigns. And so bravo and congratulations to the students at Memorial Club. And a number of us went to see the play Frozen. And we just, I thought it was just amazing. And the opportunity to, to, to see those um, actors and actresses and singers live in person was pretty incredible. So um, thank you very much to Spruce Grove Comp and all of that cast and crew. We'll go on to item 1.5. Any changes to the agenda, please? Seeing none, could I have a motion, please, to approve the agenda as presented? Trustee Cameron, all in favor, please say. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Item number two on the agenda approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of November 30th, 2021. Can I ask if there were any errors or omissions in those minutes? Okay, seeing none, seeing none on the screen, could I have a motion, please, to approve those minutes? Trustee Wagner. All in favor, please. Thank you, and everyone. Thank you, on screen. Thank you very much. That's very business arising from the minutes is item three, and I didn't see any business, so I will just look around the room and on the screen see if there's anything. Okay, thank you. Oh, so here we come to our delegation. That's just always the most exciting part. And those students have been there and patiently waiting for their um, time to present to us this morning on the Literacy Intervention Program. Um, and I'll just say a little bit about the presentation. Parkland School Division is offering a robust literacy intervention program in 18 of our schools to respond to learning interruption funded by the Alberta government through the grant that they um, have termed the Learning Loss Grant. Charity Alok, PSD's literacy facilitator, is supporting the literacy intervention at Stony Plain Central, and she will be joining remotely. She's here, has joined remotely to demonstrate one of her groups in action. And the literacy program is focusing on four literacy components, phonological awareness, word work, sight words, and text work. And so we have presenters. Um, but I think I will let our um, the 
difficult for accompanying the presenters do the introductions to make sure that you point to the right student at the right time with the right name. So I am welcoming Tammy Newman and Charity Alok, please, to the screen. Take it away. Thanks. Yes, good morning and welcome everyone virtually to Stony Plain Central this morning. We're very glad to be here and I think our students are excited to share their learning this morning. Um, as uh, Chair Stewart indicated, we have Charity Alook who has um, started with us at the end of no November supporting the work in literacy intervention alongside our literacy lead Brendan Moline um, at Stony Plain Central. We have a number of students taking part in the program and this morning I would like to introduce two of our students. Our group of four has become a group of two due to the blustery weather this morning. And so I'd like to welcome Rena Montgomery and Ella Taylor along with Charity Alook and they're going to take it from here and do a little demonstration and take you through the process of what literacy intervention may look like um, at Stony Plain Central. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so I've been working here for a few weeks now. I have six groups, along with Brendan, who has seven groups. Um, today, we are missing two of our students who prepared very um, well for this presentation and was very excited, but unfortunately, they couldn't join us. So we're just going to get right into it. Okay, so do you want to grab the books? Okay, so last class we read a story. Can you tell me about the story, Ella? It was about a wise About a Okay, and what was he bragging about, Ella? Okay. Raina, can you tell me one specific instance where he was bragging and to who? The mouse and the flamingo about who that blows the sky name. And how did that make his friends feel? Very sad. Good. So Raina, can you tell me why did he think he was the most beautiful? Because he was the color of the sky. Okay. Why were the other birds not so beautiful from his point of view? Because they were blue, like the sky. Okay, so what did Flamingo say? I thought the color is. What color is Flamingo? Pink. And what about Mouse? What did Mouse say? What color is Mouse? Green. Green. Okay. So what happened when Bluebird met Wise Blackbird? Wise Blackbird told him that the sky is black as hell. Wow, okay. And so what lesson did Bluebird learn in this story? That every bird is the color of the sky. And it's beautiful. And was there a moral to this story? Was there a lesson he needed to learn? To not break. There you go. Okay, thank you. So let's talk. So we're going to just put our books to the side here. And what I would like to do is I would like to go to some sound segmentation. So you're going to use the sound segmentation cards. And remember when we're looking at sound segmentation, we want to break down um, the word to each individual sound that we can hear, okay? So for example, if the word was fish, we would take it very slowly and go fish. Very good. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a couple words and you're going to um, say the sounds you hear in the words, okay? And just try to speak a little bit loud, okay? Because when we're sounding out, when we're saying the sounds, it's kind of hard to make it sound a little bit loud. So, okay. all right, so here we go. Mouse. Mom, mouse. How is that? Three. Three. Very good. How about laughed? 
Good job. How many sounds is that? Four. What about the word pink? Let me try that one one more time. How about if we said pink? Do you think that might make sense? Pink. Can we try that? Okay, we'll work on that one. Very good. Okay, and last one. How about the word wise? Very good. And how many sounds is that? Three. Three. Very good. Okay, let's put our sound segmentation cards down. And now we are going to move on to initial sound manipulation. So what I'm going to do is give you each a whiteboard. I'll take a whiteboard. On the very top of the whiteboard, we're going to spell pink. Okay? So we're going to spell pink. And remember to leave some space because we're going to spell some other words. Okay? So once you have pink, I'd like you to listen very carefully. All right? Okay. First, say pink. Now say pink, but change the to a Sink. Very good. And then write it down. Okay. Now say sink. Sink. Now say sink, but change the s to a o. Link. Link. Very good. Now say link. Link. Now change the o to a burr. Good job. That was a tricky one. Okay, now say break. 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 Now change the fur to a mm. mink. Mink. Go ahead and write that down. Good job, girls. Now let's hold up our boards. And we'll read through each of those words together. Ready? One, two, three. Pink, sink, link, brink, mink. Very good. Okay, now you can go. They all rhyme. Thank you very much. Which part rhymes? The ending. The ending. Can you tell me the letters or the sounds that are the ones that rhyme? I and K. I and K. Very good. So if we change the beginning sound, we can make new words and we can do rhyming words, right? Yeah. So if you know I and K says ink, and all you need to do is sound out the beginning sound, that initial sound, then you will learn a whole lot more words, right? Yeah, very good. Can you think of any other words that might fit into this word family? Sure. Tink. Yes, tink. You can add tink. And what about when you do this with your eyes? Blink. Perfect. Very good. Okay, let's put our boards to the side. I'm very glad you said that, Rena, because now we're going to move into our rhyme recognition. Okay, so you can just put your boards up there in the pile. We'll make sure we wipe those down after. Okay, so Rena, you brought us into our next part of rhyme recognition, okay? So can you tell us one more time what a rhyme is? It's the same ending. Okay, words that have the same ending. Can, um, Ella, can you tell me two words that rhyme? Duck and luck. Duck and luck, very good. Okay, so I'm going to tell you some words. And you are going to say yes or no. Yes if they rhyme, no if they don't rhyme. Ready? How about sorry, watch, catch? And why do those not rhyme? Because they don't have the same ending. They have the same ending, but there's something that's not the same. The vowel. The vowel, very good. Watch, catch. The vowel is very different, isn't it? Very good. That's a tricky one. 
How about night flight? Very good. Okay, how about Ella? Four bag. No? Okay, very good. How about right sight? Yeah. yeah. Very good. And how about tape chair? No, very good. Why does tape and chair not rhyme, Ella? So they don't rhyme, right? Very good. Okay, so now we're going to get into a little more tricky um, sound manipulation. Uh, we've done this before. So this is the medial sound manipulation, okay? So this is a one minute activity that comes out of Kilpatrick's work. Um, ready? Okay, say hot. Now say hot, but instead of ah, say ah. Hat. Hat, very good. Say lap. Now say lap, but instead of the ah, say if. Very close, let's try that again. Now say lap. Now say lap, but instead of the a, ah, say if. Lip. Very good. Now say deck. Deck. Now say deck, but instead of a, eh, say a. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, now say bag. Bag. Now instead of, oh sorry, now say bag, but instead of a, ah, say a. Ah. Uh -huh. oh, very good. Now say fat. fat. Now say fat, but instead of a, ah, say if. Fit. Very good. Now say cap. cap. Now say cap, but instead of a, ah, say a. Uh. Good. Okay, this one's for arena only. Now say rock. rock. Now say rock, but instead of a, ah, say a. Ah. Very good. Ella. Now say man. Now say man, but instead of a, ah, say eh. Very good. Rina, sorry. Now say run. Run. Now say run, but instead of a, ah, say a. Ah. Ran. Very good. Okay. Um, Ella. Now say lad. Yeah. Now say lad, but instead of a, ah, say eh. Very good. Those were tricky, weren't they? All right, and then our final activity, we're going to go into some rhyme sorting from the IPA. Um, all the schools, a majority of the schools have IPA kits. And on this activity, you're going to each get, let's go six cards. And then you can have a look at your six cards. And what I'd like you to do is see if you have any rhyming pairs, okay? And then I'm going to spread the rest of the cards out on the table in the front here. And remember, when you're looking for a rhyming pair, if you don't know what the card is, like what the picture is, you can ask. And if you don't have a rhyming pair, but your partner beside you does, you can sneak and take their card, okay? Because we want to make as many pairs as we can. I see Ella already have a pair. Can you tell us your rhyming pair? Cake and Very good. Rina. Very good. Ella, do you have any more? Yep. Very good. Rina. Can we try that again? Walk and walk. Are those rhyming? No. Okay, let's try again. I see one that might go with lock. Very close. But then try it again. Here, listen to the sounds, okay? Lock, cop. Very good. Can you say them again? Nice and loud. and mop. Very good. Thank you, Ella. Soft. Very good. Rina? Very 
Elena, do you not see any more? Very good. Let's do uh, two more. How about in your pile? See any in your pile that might match over here? How about this one? wanted to say uh, good job girls it was excellent and I just wanted to ask uh, out of curiosity about how many of you would be in a literacy intervention group that you work with on a regular basis? In our group so we have anywhere from three to five students at a time based on um, their reading assessments as well as their past and QPAS data. So this group typically has four. I have other groups that have three. And then as we started the first two weeks, we have to adjust and reassess a few students because after working through some of the activities, um, we found that some of the students may have been a little lower than we thought they were or higher than we thought they were. So we did some internal adjustments as well between um, Mr. Wallen and myself. Sounds great. Thank you. And again, girls, great job. Thank you. Any questions from um, trustees who are joining us remotely? I just thought you did such a fantastic job. And as you were going through, I was trying to think of rhyming words uh, for trustee. And 
some of the words that I came up with were uh, crusty, musty. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's happy words that rhyme with trustees. So um, if you can think of one, uh, maybe you can come back to us and let me know um, if there's uh, maybe a more happy rhyming word uh, that we can use for trustee. But thank you so much for letting us watch and learn how you learn. Um, I wonder as a parent, you know, I, I'm starting to appreciate the books uh, and maybe the songs, the repetitive songs and the repetitive nature of children's books. And, you know, what I thought was uh, maybe just a gimmick um, for kids to enjoy, I see now uh, is actually a part of the building blocks of them learning these sounds and these words and how to replace uh, letters here and there and things that maybe um, we as adults take for granted. And so, um, you know, two things come to mind, um, you know, for us to maybe uh, express to parents like myself who would not know the value of these things is um, reading with our kids and maybe um, putting up with uh, what may seem like this monotonous, sometimes painful exercise <laughs> of uh, going through the rhyming words and going through the songs and doing all those things and how important they are uh, at this stage. And so um, uh, thank you so much for showing us how that works. Um, ladies, you did an excellent job. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. So I would just like to, um, again, on behalf of the board, thank you very much for welcoming us into your classroom this morning. And um, Irena and Ella, you did an amazing job. You were missing two of your classmates who would have been um, working with you this morning. And so you just carried it off very professionally, very well. Thank you very much for that. And as I use my pen and think about ink, as I think about the, one of our favorite, um, the favorite color of our superintendent, which is pink, um, when I go skating on my rink, and when I do dishes in my sink, I will remember your lesson, I will remember those rhyming words. And I am challenged, but I am motivated to find a positive word that rhymes with trustee, because I know that there are lots of them. Thank you very much, thanks. And we will take um, about a three minute break and we'll um, give us an opportunity for the students and the staff to leave. Thank you very much.
you, I welcome us back at 9.40. And we will move on to item five, which is the board chair report. Correspondence, we have a number of Christmas cards that I will put in the trustee lounge for your viewing. And I will move on. Um, one of our assurance elements is that we engage, listen, and advocate. So how do we advocate at all levels on behalf of students, families, and staff in PSD? So I'd like just to talk about the curriculum. So we have advocated to the curriculum for, or sorry, to the government for delayed implementation of the draft K-6 curriculum. And we have also advocated to our associations at um, ASPA, Alberta School Boards Association, and Public School Boards Association. Uh, for issues with curriculum content and timing. At the minister's announcement yesterday, December 13th, she noted that the mathematics, the English language arts and literature, and physical education and wellness would be implemented in September 2022. The others have been delayed. She also, the minister also noted the um, development of an implementation advisory committee will be formed in February 2022 and will provide feedback and input regarding those three subjects. There is an opportunity to have input to that committee and so the Implementation Advisory Committee could provide recommendations to the Minister on timelines, how, when, for the three subjects that are being implemented in September and as the will sit on that committee. Resources are being developed and funding is being considered and continued feedback will be accepted until January 31st, 2022. And um, there was a board chair's meeting on December 1st, 2021 that I was unable to attend, but I followed up with ASBA and was provided an opportunity to review the confidential draft report that will be submitted to the minister on curriculum draft feedback. And given the announcement yesterday and the increase in time till the end of January, that report, that draft report will be revised and we will have an opportunity to review it again before it goes to the minister. And for um, demonstrating responsibility and governance actions and allocating fiscal resources, uh, we did all receive an e email with an opportunity to, opportunity to have input into budget 2022 survey and to be part of the budget 2022 town hall. So you have that. And I attended a meeting in Ottawa on December 10th at MLA Getson's office with a trustee from Northern Gateway and three representatives from the Hindu and Indian community organizations of Alberta. So they prepared a very thorough analysis of the draft K-6 curriculum um, in regards to Hinduism and Indian civilization contributions. So they presented their feedback, their information to MLA Getson. They were articulate, presented their information clearly, and MLA Getson noted that he would advise the Minister of Education and take that forward. And then lastly, but not least, just I'd like on behalf of the board to extend a heartfelt thanks to our superintendent and her team for the unwavering commitment to students, staff, and families, and also for ensuring that the operational aspects of this very large Parkland School Division are met and carried out so professionally and effectively and warm wishes for a winter break. That's my report, thank you. Any questions? Okay, I see none. We will move to item six, the superintendent's report. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I have a few items that I can um, uh, speak to you about this morning. First of all, I just wanted to share with uh, trustees that uh, I've spent some time over the last few weeks doing um, one-on-one -on -one meetings with uh, directors and principals. That's something I do every year, but this is the first year in a long time that I have uh, been able to go into schools to have those meetings um, back in when COVID first hit us in earnest. Uh, we made a decision not to have any non-essential visitors in schools, and unless there was an emergency, I was I considered myself a non-essential visitor, and so this is the first time in quite some time that I've been in schools where they are, um, where students are there and actively engaged in their learning 
Uh, and so it, was, it uh, continues to make me so proud of the work that uh, our staff and students are doing together, the resilience and the commitment they demonstrate. Um, and I was especially excited to see uh, firsthand what you all witnessed this morning, um, that uh, the work they're doing around literacy um, and uh, engagements in that area, and also the dedication to staff and student wellness, which you will hear a little bit more about this morning as well. Um, and so in those schools, lots of stuff happening, like I said, all of that work around literacy and numeracy, inter or mainly literacy interventions, numeracy will start after uh, the holiday break, but also schools are continuing to be creative in how they host their holiday celebrations for, for staff, or sorry, for students, um, and uh, being able to uh, get links to live feeds or recordings to parents so that uh, parents can at least uh, virtually see what uh, what their children are doing in school celebration wise a couple of other things uh, we've heard from a few other organizations around uh, substitute teachers and a shortage of substitute teachers being experienced uh, we are we have uh, pockets of um, of shortages throughout uh, every you know throughout our schools but certainly not to the extent that uh, many of our neighbors are experiencing that um, I think uh, most of those shortages are caused uh, by when we already have a large uh, organize the organization has something large planned like an NBCI training or something like that and then we um, it's the time of year and also uh, complicated by COVID where people wake up and they don't feel well and then they need a last minute so so we certainly have experiences like that the other complicating factor for us is at this time of year is when our substitute teacher pool is at its lowest because um, our this is when after the time that we would have hired for temporary contracts and generally speaking most of those temporary contracts come from our substitute teacher list um, and also it's before our uh, university grads graduate or finish they will finish in December and start again in January so we see so we see a little bit of a lull now but we expect it will be uh, taken care of uh, for the most part in January although um, with the uh, with the increased attention to not coming to work when you are not well uh, we, we see certainly an increased demand for substitute teachers I also um, and uh, chair Stewart talked about this a little bit earlier but um, operationally speaking I think that we feel like we got an early holiday gift from the ministry with yesterday's announcement that uh, there will be a delay in the implementation of some parts of the curriculum and that the government will be going ahead with uh, English language arts and literature math music and phys ed and wellness um, that uh, that other subjects will be updated and new drafts will be presented or released later on in the spring and also that there will be a scope and sequence document a blueprint released regarding social studies um, we uh, I don't know uh, I think that um, that certainly comes as a relief to our staff and certainly to administration in terms of how to implement uh, the full K-6 curriculum in one year, and so this is a, a very good uh, step towards uh, something more manageable for us. Um, a couple of other updates. I wanted to let trustees know about uh, modular classrooms that we uh, had uh, requested. We were originally told that we should receive those modular classrooms in uh, June of 2021 for both Prescott and for Mill Grove School. Later on that spring, we were told that they would be delayed until the fall, and now we have since been informed uh, further that we should not expect the Prescott modulars prior to April of 2022, um, and but we haven't received any updated timelines for the Mill Grove ones, so they're not here yet, and um, more to come on that as we learn more. Um, December is when we start, but we try to delay until January, but we start uh, having conversations about setting programming and budgets for the 2022-2023 school year. And so we've started to look into enrollment projections already, um, and we'll, um, uh, because those need to be submitted to Alberta Education. And we expect to um, jump fully into budget conversations very quickly after Christmas break or after the holiday break. So that's the work that we are starting to do in earnest right now. 
Um, and finally, I wanted to share some um, really great news with trustees because sometimes we don't get to do that. Uh, if you can see, if those of you online can see, this is the award magazine. I don't know how to leave the camera, there we go. Uh, award magazine is a, uh, and a magazine dedicated to ar architecture, design, and construction. The December edition of this um, magazine is out, and we, in Parkland School Division, are nicely featured with Woodhaven School, the construction, the modernization of Woodhaven School. It's a great article. It's very complimentary about the build and the process. Uh, it also includes quotes in it from um, uh, the architect, uh, start to architecture, the general contractor, Stuart Olson, Principal Shaw, Director Labrie, and I even managed to get a, a little quote in there too. Uh, so the article includes a number of great photos that we submitted, and so I'm going to leave this uh, copy of this magazine in the trustee lounge for the next time you're here. You could uh, brief, briefly go through it. Uh, it's about, um, it, it runs over three pages, so I just wanted to finish with that. It's a, it's a fabulous uh, uh, showcase of Woodhaven that is an um, amazingly beautiful school that modernization turned out so well. So thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to see the, the article regarding the Woodhaven modernization. I think that's pretty exciting. I do hope there's gonna be an opportunity for trustees to tour the new facility. I know it was not part of the first school tours, so I, I do hope that there may be an opportunity to see that unless it's on the next school tour right off the bat. Thank you. Um, so Trustee Cameron is asking whether or not Woodhaven will be on the list of schools to that trustees will get an opportunity to tour uh, in the next go round. Um, we haven't finalized who will be on there on the next go round, uh, but definitely Woodhaven will be one that you do need to get in and see. Uh, it is, um, and they uh, they continue to fill the school with uh, furniture and um, and uh, finish up, but it, it does look great. And uh, there's plenty of room there for kids now because there certainly wasn't before. Trustee Montgomery had a question before you closed the last topic. Sorry, go ahead, please, Trustee Montgomery. I missed that. You had a question? That's no problem. I thought perhaps I could. Um, thank you uh, for the opportunity. I was just concerned about the modular, um, what appears to be a delay uh, in the delivery of the modulars. Um, I know that in the last meeting we had put in a request for the next modulars, and my understanding is that the Prescott ones should have been not only delivered but in place uh, in September um, of this year. And now, if I understood correctly, they were coming in in April of uh, 2022. Yes. And so, uh, you know, is it anticipated that we would then have the request from this year? also seeing a further delay, or is this just normal course? I, I wouldn't say that it is normal by any stretch. It's normal to have some delay, but not uh, the significant delay like this one is. I think that uh, there are supply issues that um, that may have contributed to it. Um, uh, 
and the, certainly the number of modulars that were requested across the province may have contributed to it. Uh, we aren't, uh, you know, this is something that we, we do need to rely on um, government for. So we, uh, our hope is, now I know hope is not a great strategy, but our hope is that uh, this is a one-off, partly due to COVID, and that as we request modulars going forward, that the delays are certainly not as significant as uh, these ones were. Okay, thank you. Um, so to move to the first of, uh, I think, three administrative reports today. Uh, first of all is our report on staff and student wellness. I want to welcome uh, Division Principal Christine Ross to the table. Uh, and uh, as trustees know, our ultimate goal in Parkland School Division remains student success and well-being, but we certainly are aware that students don't experience success on any level unless they are well, and they also don't experience success unless the staff who surround them are well, as uh, in addition, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so to lead you through the highlights and some of the details around the work that we continue to do around staff and student wellness, um, I want to turn it over to Associate Superintendent Dr. Mascolzi and uh, Division Principal Ross. Good morning, everyone. So as uh, Superintendent Boyce um, reviewed, our ultimate goal is student success and well-being, and so we prioritize student and staff wellness. And we do that through um, programming um, and providing supports and services that focus on the health of children, youth, and then also their families to provide a holistic approach to support. So wellness can be defined in many ways. Uh, we define it as creating healthy, responsive, and innovative learning environments that are rich with evidence-based norms for healthy communities. And we focus in three areas of physical activity, nutritious foods, and positive social environments. Um, and as Superintendent Boyce mentioned, she stole my thunder there a bit. We believe <laughs> that if students and staff are unwell, um, their ability to engage in the school and life may be compromised. And so we have to focus on that as a foundation so students can be regulated and well in order to learn within the schools. And so we embed those areas into our teaching and learning environments, and we do that in a few ways. We do that both in providing preventative and universal supports and also um, supporting intervention when it's required. This has become of significant importance and growing importance in the community and within the school division because this is the third school year now within the pandemic. And so we see those needs continuing to rise. Um, so the work that we do in these areas are supported through our community partners as well, like we discussed in last month's board meeting as well as provided by our school-based staff and by the Wellness and Community Partnership team, which includes our Division Principal of Wellness and Community Partnership, Division Principal Ross, our Wellness Coordinator, Felicia Oaks, our Family Support Facilitator, Sunrise Program, um, Supports Program Liaison, and as well um, as previously mentioned in our prior board meeting, uh, we have recently hired a Divisional Psychologist to help us focus in on that area of mental well-being because we know this is an increasing need and concern within our schools. So I'm gonna ask Division Principal Ross to speak to staff wellness, followed by a review of comprehensive school health, and then I'll jump back in and we'll go back and forth. Thank you, Associate Superintendent Nascalzi. I wanted to, when I'm speaking about staff wellness, I wanted to share a quote with you um, from a book. I chose this book very deliberately. It's called Teachers These Days by Dr. Jody Carrington. And this was a book study that I just completed with um, some folks around staff wellness. And so I wanted to share with you this uh, powerful statement, which I believe also ref reflects how, how we believe. It says, if teachers aren't okay, their students don't stand a chance. And so that echoes the comments from Dr. Uh, from Associate Superintendent Ms. Golzi and from Superintendent Boyce. Um, what 
once a month we have staff wellness representatives who get together to share stories, resources, and ideas, um, and collaborate over ways to support staff. Members of the, the team include uh, representatives from each school, as I mentioned, human resources representatives, as well as from the ATA and the school, Alberta School Employee Benefit Fund to support this important work. Uh, some staff wellness opportunities. Uh, there's some listed. I just wanted to highlight a couple of them uh, for all of our staff that are available online. Some of them are available online and some are in person. Uh, but we do have mindful mindfulness and movement for staff well-being, uh, community yoga, and we've had some book studies. And there been they're having some professional learning sessions for new teachers around wellness and managing stress. We do have some staff wellness activities uh, through Play Parkland for staff, and you can see those that are listed. Um, we don't we don't contribute any any funding in terms of folks participating in those activities. Rather, the partners are offering uh, substantial discounts to to staff members who wish to participate in those uh, staff appreciations. Um, in collaboration with the staff wellness representatives and and wellness coordinator Oaks, um, this fall in November, uh, to each each school site, uh, we had a cobs and uh, coffee deliveries uh, to to teachers and school staff, just to show our appreciations. And those came with messages from ASABP and Homewood Health. Uh, next steps to support wellness to support staff wellness we are exploring the CAS workplace workplace wellness and implementation guide for the 2022-23 school year in terms of student wellness um, I'm going to first talk about comprehensive school health this isn't new to Parkland School Division. As you know, we've had a focus on student well-being through the Wellness Initiative uh, for many years. And what is new is the, the visual that you'll see and some of the packaging. The big ideas remain the same. In terms of the comprehensive school health approach, uh, we focus on three tenets, active living, healthy eating, and mental well-being. These tenets are supported by the pillars and the pillars include social and physical environment, teaching and learning, healthy school policy, partnerships, and services. In addition to that, we have worked to develop an administrative procedure on comprehensive school health. Once that is improved, approved, school leaders will participate in professional learning, focus, focusing on developing the action plans uh, to support the requirements as outlined in the administrative procedure. To support the work of comprehensive school health, we have something called Health Champions. Uh, this is a group of people um, uh, who get together in one month, and it's a capacity building model. And they are the primary contact for the school around the health and wellness initiatives, and they work in collaboration with the school administrators in developing and implementing the comprehensive school health action plans. And they are, they are valuable members of the school-based team. So we frame our services and supports around a continuum of supports, and that can be visualized in many ways. I've, I've done this on a, on a spectrum, a chart there for you, but you may have seen it as response to intervention pyramid or a collaborative response pyramid in the sense that we can support students within universal supports where all students access supports related to wellness, targeted for small groups of students, and at that top of the tier pyramid is those intensive and individualized supports. When it comes to the supports offered at the school, they're offered at all levels within the area of wellness. From a division level, most of our supports focus around that universal preventative supports and then that individualized top of the tier supports. And so we're going to focus the remainder of this report on specific examples that illustrate some of those universal 
um, preventative, and then individualized and intensive supports in the three areas of those tenants that we talked about. Um, and so I'm going to have Division Principal Ross cover active living and healthy eating, and then I'll cover over the mental well-being tenant. Thank you, Associate Superintendent Nascalzi. In regards to active eating, I, or sorry, in regards to active living, I just want to highlight a couple of things. Um, one is around, uh, we do have daily DPA in every, in schools, kindergarten to grade nine. Uh, and I wanted to speak a little bit about the Try Me Triathlon and the pedestrian parade. And that these have become a really important part of our culture in wellness and PSC over the years and are great examples of strong community partnerships. We are planning at this point in time for a modified COVID-friendly pedestrian parade during Mental Health Awareness Week and a modified COVID-friendly Trimie Triathlon that would be in June. In terms of healthy eating uh, and preventative supports, the Breakfast Clubs of Canada, we have nine schools um, who have access to nutritious foods at the beginning of each day. Our nutrition nooks are in 23 out of 24 schools, and those are with prepackaged and healthy snacks that students can eat throughout the day as well. The emergency lunch program provides a healthy lunch and whole fruit item uh, twice per week. And I wanted to draw your attention to the graphic on page five. Um, so in addition to healthy eating, you can see that food scarcity is very real in, in our area. And you can see the significant jump in terms of breakfast clubs of 725 students who had access last year to the 3,600 students who have access uh, to, the, to the breakfast club this year. In terms of nutrition notes, you can see that the demand has been steadily increasing over the, it's basically doubled from two years ago. And you can see that our the lunch programs and the food for families, those two graphics refer to the 2020-21 school year. When it comes to mental well-being within our schools, um, we have specific preventative and individualized supports I'm going to review, but before I get to that, I want to um, speak specifically about to two of our initiatives that target all areas on that spectrum. Um, the first is our counseling services. So our divisional psychologist once hired, she's just finished conducting an environmental scan and we've been doing a needs assessment across the division about what supports and services are required in our schools to meet the well, uh, mental health and well-being needs of our students. Um, currently, what we've discovered is the availability of counseling services varies significantly between our schools. And so based on our assessments, we are creating a division-wide counseling framework that's going to create a system-wide approach so that there's equity and access between all of our schools, regardless of location or size, to be able to access counseling supports and services, both at that preventative level and individualized level. And so although it does exist in all of our schools in one way or another, we want to be able to pull together all those people within those roles to have a unified approach um, to supporting our students. And that will, of course, involve working with our community partners as well. The Change Health Clinic is also something I want to address. We've talked about Change Health and our partnership with them before. This piece is specifically about the clinic component. And so within our Memorial um, High School, as well as within our Connections for Learning campuses, um, we have Dr. Doug Klein, who does a lot of promotion and preventative work um, on that end of the continuum of supports, working with our kids, playing in the gym, doing presentations in comp class, bringing some of those focus on mental well-being. And on the individualized side, we have a health clinic that's focused and has a team of doctors um, works with the community connectors to get our students connected to local doctors as soon as we can to try and bridge that gap. And I'll speak a little bit later to how, how those um, Change Health is helping to be one of our significant partners in bridging that gap to services for our families. We are in the process of extending that. Dr. Kirsten Puznak, Puznak will be joining us. She um, is going to be starting the Change Health Clinic out of Spruce Grove Composite School. And so we're just working through all those pieces. She's been introduced and done a tour. 
Um, for specific examples on the preventative and universal side, um, schools currently use a variety of social emotional programs um, within their schools, and I've listed some examples there from zones of regulations to worry, warriors to rainbows, friendship groups focusing on emotional regulation, and those shift um, dependent on the needs of the students in every school year. Um, we also have a monthly strong family education series and a stronger together newsletter that we covered in more detail um, during our community partnership board report at the last board meeting. Um, on the individualized and intensive supports, other than the counseling services that we're developing in more detail, um, we have our Parkland School Division family supports and Sunrise supports, which we also discussed in more detail last month, as well as some others we wanted to highlight was our social emotional support facilitators, and they support schools specifically in the area of positive behavior supports, trauma-informed practices, and help to build the capacity, staff capacity, um, in, within the area of supporting students with social emotional learning. Another um, highlight was our partnership with Remuda Horsemanship, which is an equine assisted social skills development program where we send several students um, to help support them in the development of pro social skills through their interaction with the horses. And so that's been a, um, an excellent partnership and a source of wellness for many of our students. Uh, the Community Connectors, we also reviewed in detail last month, supporting our youth age 11 plus. Um, and something else that's been really excellent this year is we have access through our partnership with Family Life Psychology um, and Little Oaks to free online counseling services for students and families through community partners. And so we advertise that to many of our families where um, for our families who may not have access to benefits or, or services, they can access three to eight sessions on average per referral. Um, and so um, that's, that's available to any of our families. Um, and then additionally through um, another grant to the RBC Foundation, I should have mentioned um, the free online counseling was also provided through the grant through the RBC Foundation for Youth and Mental Health Navigation. Uh, we have uh, some supports identified with cab fare. So if transportation is the barrier for getting students and their families to appointments, um, that grant has helped us to bridge that gap for families. And so there's a nice infographic there about the student wellness map. And you can see on the left, we have where our students begin, who need support with wellness in our schools within our mandate. We do our best to meet their needs and provide their support. And our ultimate goal is to have them have increased positive connections, safety, health, and well-being. On the right, there's our student goals. And sometimes what presents a challenge is, although those service providers exist, our medical professionals, our specialized healthcare services, and our community partners, many of our students need some bridge builders between education and between health. And so that's where our partnerships come in handy. <laughs> that's where they're needed. And so those bridge builders, as you see, um, have been our PSD family support teams, our community connectors, and the change health partnership we have with the clinic, who help us um, support our families and try to make it as seamless as possible to navigate um, those systems to get our students to the other side of the wellness map, which is um, continuing. So we have a lot of ongoing work in process. Um, wellness is an area that there's never, well, just like with anything we do in a school division, there's no end goal. You're constantly refining and improving. And so currently we're in the process of implementing, as I mentioned, a division-wide counseling model with equity. And our division psychologist will be and has begun to pilot um, providing clinical supervision to our counselors in the division which is going to provide a unified um, vision for counseling as it currently exists in, great things are happening, but they're happening um, in, in pods. And so we're gonna pull that together. So there's a shared vision for what counseling looks like. Um, and for that focus as well on continuing to have clinical conversations and supports. So that is work that we recognize and that we're working towards. Also, we need to continue to grow our partnerships with Change Health and with the Westview PCN. Um, we, uh, Division Principal Ross and I just had a really great meeting with the Westview PCN to start moving some of those forward, as well as other community organizations and agencies. Um, we're also investigating the creation of school-based CSH or Community School Health Committees. So we have those health champions in place, and once our administrative procedure um, is in place um, and our schools have um, 
they're already doing the great work. It's just a matter of putting on paper the great work they're doing. And so once we have that on paper, the idea of having a school-based committee to increase that voice and leadership and potentially have students join that committee so there can be some peer-to-peer, -peer, um, some of those peer improved peer-to-peer -peer interactions where they can become the voice and leaders within their school sites. And then we will, of course, continue to identify appropriate partners and funding opportunities to support the growth of our initiatives moving forward. So there's a, a lot of great work happening from the Wellness and Community Partnership team, um, and it will continue to be an ongoing focus. Um, we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. I just have a couple of comments and a question. Uh, first of all, the comments are, I, I really appreciate the idea of a continuum of support. So we do know that uh, students who have deficits at the school level can't be dealt with just in isolation. We need to connect with family and community. So I certainly appreciate that approach to it. I'm really, really encouraged with the idea of equity and access to counseling services. We do know that it's not an equal playing field at this point, and uh, to recognize that and, and deal with it, I think is, is an excellent uh, way to go. My question, and it's just out of curiosity, is that Parkland School Division Family Supports, Sunrise Supports, and Community Connectors all have comments in them about help accessing supports. My question is, do they coordinate with each other or do they work in isolation? That's a great question. Um, I think if we worked in isolation, it would be very hard to get anything done. Um, and there'd be a lot of duplication of services, which sometimes can be a, a family's need, and at other times uh, could be delegated somewhere else. So um, luckily, um, the sun, we have a Sunrise support team member, right? That, that Sunrise table really helps bring together different members from different um, areas of government and other areas of community to support our students with really significant family needs. And our, our Sunrise Support team member um, also is, is part of Parkland School Division, and so she works closely with our Parkland, um, with our Family Support Facilitator, so they have a connection. As well, um, uh, Community Connectors um, will work very closely with our um, Wellness Community Partnership team and with Division Principal Ross and her team, and so um, we try to pull all those pieces together um, th there's a lot of moving parts, <laughs> but uh, I think that we can continue to improve on that, but there is opportunities for collaboration. <coughs> Trustee Osborne, then Trustee Montgomery, and then Trustee McCann, please. Thank you. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, Associate Superintendent Dr. Muscolzi, but it is the holiday season, and so my question to you is, if you had a wish list, what would be on it? And how could we support that? Chocolate, no, I'm joking. Um, so um, in order to support our students over the holidays, what's really required is that we have services that can remain up and going through the, through the season. And that's where, as we develop um, our counseling services, I think we need to recognize that within a school, um, you know, we work. We don't work 24-hour services. We work during school school days and hours, and that's where, as much as we're going to build up our counseling supports and services within a school, that's where there's those partnerships to our children, family services, mental health, and uh, West VPCN, and all those other areas um, provide those ongoing supports is so necessary. Um, so my my hope would be that. Um, some of the questions that we've been receiving uh, through CAS as of late is asking us about how to strengthen partnerships between education and health, which I feel is promising that we've been asked some of those questions about how to revisit some of the partnership aspects that were lost um, with the um, dissolution of the R RCSD. Uh, so my hope would be that we can get to a place, and I think we're working towards that, um, where um, we have more of a seamless opportunities for ongoing connection between education and health so that our families don't feel that um, that divide 
Um, and luckily for park, the Parkland region, um, everyone I have met within this region has that same goal at those tables and has been very receptive to those conversations. Um, so I think we're well on our way, but my wish would be that that would be strengthened, um, that that would be strengthened so that our students feel that full wraparound service model. Trustee Montgomery, please. Thank you for the opportunity. A um, couple of comments and a couple of questions. So uh, I think it's wonderful that we are uh, normalizing and perhaps destigmatizing counseling and counseling services. Um, I think it's so important that um, during this time, as we hopefully move out of the pandemic uh, crisis, that um, that will be normal, that will be normalized, that uh, we're going to need to talk and we're going to need to sort out all the things uh, that uh, three school years that have been impacted by this pandemic uh, are, are going to create for our students so, and our teachers. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, with that. Um, a second comment I had is maybe anecdotal in that last year when I, I needed uh, someone to talk to and I needed um, services, I, I knew of the availability, but I literally felt like I needed someone to dial the phone for me. Um, the instructions could not be go to Homewood Health and, and see what's available and, and access. It was, you know, here is the website and here is where you click and here is the person you call. And um, I, I hope that there is some focus there in uh, not just informing, but in actually um, perhaps fostering or hand holding uh, to get people where they need to be uh, when perhaps they, they can't navigate that, that themselves. My two questions are, uh, one with the Change Health Clinic sustainability, I understand that there's funding uh, outside of education dollars for this clinic. Uh, what's the commitment and how sustainable is it going forward? Um, uh, you know, and, and I'm assuming that there are, are hopes that it will continue on, but if it doesn't, you know, how are we going to navigate that? Uh, and secondly, measurement of success in these types of initiatives is always very difficult where it's qualitative over quantitative. And uh, how do we close that feedback loop to ensure that we're showing um, what success looks like uh, going forward? Thank you. Thank you for your questions. So um, with regards to the Change Health initiatives, you're right. One of my concerns as we started to look at Change Health is it is such a great service, those clinics and we are growing it, and so what does sustainability look like? Um, and there's no simple solution to that. However, we are having those conversations with the PCN, with Change Health, and with our community partners. Um, currently, some of the funding is provided through uh, grants, and so we'll be working together as a team. Um, it's not a PSD problem, it's not a Change Health problem, it's not a Westview PCN problem, it's, it's a, it, it's, a, it's more looking at what are the solutions. I feel very confident with some of our early conversations that we're going to be able to find funding for next year, and that's gonna provide that bridge funding that we're gonna to require to have a more built-in sustainable plan. So I do not have promises for having a long-term plan, but I do think that the, what we need is relationships, and we need to have all the right people at the table, and I, I feel like that first initial piece is already really well established. So um, I can give updates as the, as the years progress, uh, but that's where we're at now with that. As far as uh, measurement, um, that is actually one of the reasons why uh, I said earlier, we're creating these comprehensive school health action plans um, because our schools are doing great work, um, but it's not all of it's living on paper. And so our first step in creating these comprehensive school action plans is to get that great work written down um, to make sure that we're recognizing the good work that all the schools are doing within all the three tenets of health and wellness. Um, and then being able to then work with schools and our health championships, health champions and administrators to focus in on which tenant, uh, which areas of which tenant, um, and how we're gonna use all those pillars of comprehensive school health to move us forward to set targets, which we can then have data to, to actually report back on about the growth and steps we've made. Um, and so that's why, although Comprehensive School Health is very well established within Parkland School Division, that's why we're taking that current step to formalize the process a little bit more, is for the intent of, of reporting back. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning. Um, thank you very much for your presentation and also for a very extensive uh, written report. Um, I did have a couple of uh, just uh, understanding questions uh, focused on your staff wellness opportunities. Uh, you talked about uh, partnerships within the community. Um, are these open to all staff? We have, what, 1,400 people in Parkland School Division? Is every staff member so there's some barriers to it this year for sure every staff member every staff member is welcome to join these however there are barriers we discovered for example start times and so for some events originally when these were scheduled start times about drive time from some schools for however to reach them however that has since shifted um, to I believe uh, the opportunity for groups of staff to get together to, to contact these organizations and then they can set up activities on um, kind of on a joint collaborative schedule yeah, that's that. does that cover your question thank you yes um, how do we advertise or promote this through PSD <coughs> Thank you for your question, Trustee McKen. Um, at the beginning of the year, an email went out to all staff uh, sharing the information, and it's also been listed in, uh, and I forget the name of the email, but. Online. And online. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, that goes out once a month. It would be highlighted with information for staff uh, through them. We also have staff wellness reps um, who uh, we meet once a month, we encourage them to go back to their school sites and uh, just continue the conversation. Hey guys, we just so you know, these, these opportunities are available for you to access. Thank you, Van. You mentioned opportunities that are that in range with the partners, community partners. Do we track that? Do we go back to those partners and to determine just how, how well it's been used? Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> Um, because there's registration for, with that, so it's tracked. So there would be a column that would identify that this is a Parkland employee that's doing this program, or they, they get a discount, or there's some way of identifying them? So they're not joining uh, activities that are already running in the community and joining them as a Parkland School Division employee. They're reaching out to these um, agents to these uh, organizations and groups and uh, and creating their own time for many or not so on our end we have a registration form where uh, like they go in and they fill out what they're interested in and so from our end we have access i will say that this year there's been some difficulty with the ease of access um, because of um, the pandemic because of um, some travel times because of just um, there wasn't a huge uptake on it because people are, are struggling with their wellness. And so we had to go back to the drawing board, we sat together um, and, and tried to eliminate some of those barriers and had to shift this about a month and a half into the school year. Thank you. Um, and this is not intended to be a loaded question, this is a sincere question. Mike, I'm curious to know whether what does an increase or decrease in staff accessing these resources mean? For example, if we're increasing people, does that mean we're not healthy? If there's a decrease, it means we're healthy. Like, what is what does it mean if people are increasing, uh, if, if, uh, increasing the access and accessing the resources? Yes, yeah, so you're asking a question that comes down to the challenging question we face within the entire area of student supports and services, which is how do you quantitatively capture um, the data? If we're having, for example, in another area of our portfolio, more threat assessments, are we targeting, is that is that because we are catching things earlier and we're doing a great job, or is there an increase need? If we have more identified student needs, is that because we have not increased student needs or because we're getting better at identifying? And so this is very similar. How is it because um, we have just a lot of enthusiastic staff and they, they, they really want to get out there and they're healthy enough to pick up the phone. Like Trustee Montgomery had said, they're, they're well enough to pick up the phone to be able to access some of these resources or is it because they're really in dire need? And so that, that in effect we can capture right now. Uh, I do not think that quantitative data will ever fully express 
any of the areas within student supports and services and will have to be captured through our engagement and through other areas through that qualitative report reporting. Awesome. So I had three other questions which you've already answered and they basically refer back to what Trustee McConnell said about how do we measure success. Um, in another life I used to sit over there and listen to board meetings for years upon years. And one of the things that always frustrated me was trustees and administrators saying how awesome the Parkland School Division was and all the great things we were doing, but I never felt it and I never saw it within the community and as a, as a teacher, and I think that leans towards culture and attitude. Um, in the first term as a trustee, we as a group chose to look at transportation, specifically busing, the fact that millions of dollars are going out of our classroom for busing, and we said we're going to deal with this. Came up with a plan three, four years later, even though we've had some kind of backward steps on it, we have achieved something that Tarski said we want done. Um, so it was measurable to something that we saw. Um, as a trustee, when we talk about staff and student wellness, I believe this is an absolutely critical component. This is perhaps probably our biggest challenge in the next few years once we get stomp on all the immediate urgent things that we have, I know that's always a challenge. But that's what I want as a trustee. I want to be able to, in a few years from now, be able to see concrete changes. I want to be able to see examples or evidence that we are changing culture, we're changing attitudes around here. Um, we have, this year, uh, two, I think, canceled buses twice this year already. Uh, a conversation that was unheard of 10 years ago that the school division would cancel buses before December. Why are we doing that? Because we understand, we recognize the things we've done in the past aren't necessarily healthy, aren't necessarily good. That's what I'm hoping to see with what you're presenting here. I mean, it's it looks fantastic. It looks lights and shining, everything's there. But at the end of the day, I want to know that we've made the changes that have happened. They have to be systemic and they have to be cultural changes. That's what I'm hearing from you today. Appreciate your direct answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for our presentation. Thank you very much for questions and comments. And um, the work and the, and the attention that you put to wellness, the information that you provided to us, uh, demonstrate how we are putting into action what needs to be in action. And you are providing us some assurance that we are addressing the needs. We know that there's always room to grow and it's a journey and we understand that and, and we accept that so but we are moving on that journey and we are moving forward so thank you very much to everyone involved in that and if we can move on now to page 19 in our package item 8.2 programs of choice report and i will turn it over to superintendent Bryce. Thank you. Uh, we, um, uh, we, we continue to be really proud in Parkland School Division of the number of programs we offer, uh, programs of choice, to all of our families within our school division. Um, and we like to be able to present information to the Board of Trustees around those programs and uh, to whom they, they uh, well, who, who's all enrolled in them and uh, the, the growth and the movement that we've had on those. So I just want to uh, turn this over to Associate Superintendent Johnston to talk through the details and also welcome Division Principal Cheryl Bridgman to the table uh, who will also uh, contribute to the conversation. Good morning. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Bridgman. Maybe not. Um, so as Superintendent Boyce uh, indicates, our division prides itself on being responsive to student need. We have two short reports here. Um, to consider the difference between the two reports, the first one is the Programs of Choice report, um, and those are programs. So if you think about it in terms of a student 
um, enrolling in an idea of education over the course of the year. Uh, the second report um, that will follow is more of a course um, report with respect to off-campus and so um, students would be in uh, high school uh, in regular programming and uh, subscribe to certain courses that may take them off campus. Um, generally speaking, we're seeing an increase um, you know, in our programs uh, of choice across the board. It's a little tricky to tell because last year was such a, um, a different year. Um, but we do see uh, a wide variety of offering and we, and we see student increases in those numbers. Um, with uh, some of these programs, that they, they change during the year, some do not, uh, in terms of enrollments. And so uh, you would see French Immersion, for instance, the students that start in the beginning of the year um, would remain in that program throughout the year. Uh, but a program like Outreach uh, may continue to increase students um, as the year goes on. And so, uh, French Immersion remains stable at 1210. Uh, our Maranatha Christian program, uh, fairly stable at, uh, at 316. Uh, our Outreach program is at 312. You'll see last year's numbers at 405, but again, Outreach increases during the year. Um, virtual Learning is uh, up to 265. Uh, home Education has dropped. So, uh, that will be expected again from last year. We had a, a strong number of students um, last year, early in the pandemic, that uh, that, that were um, enrolled in home education have returned to us. Um, uh, we see in the uh, Portland's um, Athletic Academy uh, an increase in programs as well, uh, nature-based kindergarten. Um, and then I, I just want to take a moment to feature adult education. Um, this number shows up in another way. Uh, you saw in the recent annual education results report that we look at um, uh, we look at high school completion rates and also transition to post-secondary and so the team uh, you know with principal McNaughton the team that is working to get individuals back into school they've been doing some really nice work to uh, to track down those missing credits and those students and and, and so we see that we have um, and uh, we have uh, an increase in adult education and this is an area that I know there's interest in continuing to increase um, and that's it for the, um, the uh, numbers with respect to the programs of choice. Division Principal uh, Bridgman is here. Uh, should you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the last word you said, adult education, I guess, is what piqued my interest. Um, I know that, uh, and I'll just was driving on the east end of the city for the first time in years and uh, realized that the old Capilano Mall is now known as King's College. And um, I know we've had conversation that uh, if we go west of Edmonton, there is literally nothing out there for adults. And you've talked about the fact that there might be an interest in that. Um, with our anticipation or with our pre-science, I guess, of uh, doing choice programming and offering uh, opportunities for kids that have never been there before, I guess that was, it would be my question. We have kids that are, you know, basically 18 leaving high school, but there's a huge gap right now between 18 and 28 or 29. And uh, I, I guess I still see a 19 year old or 20 year old as a kid and no opportunities out in this area. Are we seeing a demand from kids that kind of are just stepping past what legally, I guess, is a student, a high school student? Uh, is there a need out there for us to look for, maybe not us to be providing, but pointing in the direction of where can we find education for, I'll use the word, young adults? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm not sure who would like to respond to that. Deputy Superintendent Francis, please. So, uh, good afternoon or good morning. Um, so, in answer to the question, uh, just one clar clarification first is uh, students that are 19 years old uh, as of September 1st are not included in that number. So, you could have a student that uh, if they're 19 on September 1st, so if they turn 
you know, 20 in, in October, we can still uh, provide service for them. So that will not capture those one year out students. And even sometimes, depending on when they graduate, even potentially two years out. So we will actually have more students than that 27, just because they are still fully funded uh, when they're 19 years old, as long as they're 19 year old on, on September 1, they can still uh, take courses. Um, but yes, we do uh, see a, a, a need. Um, the, the hard part for a school division, however, is that, uh, of course, our mandate and our, and our, our dollars um, are, are for school-aged children. And so right now, what we do is we do offer education, uh, but similar to the, the uh, School of Choice transportation is if we have a vacant seat, we would, of course, uh, sell that seat uh, to someone. Uh, it would be the same thing in, in, our, in our adult education is if we have capacity to bring in five or in this case 27 adult students without increasing staff because it is a tuition pay agreement and um, uh, you know and so we wouldn't of course be able to add in teaching time um, unless it was financially viable because that would be taken away from our, uh, our legal mandate. Follow up Trustee McCann. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. And I guess further to that, and I just to reemphasize it, uh, um, I believe that we are probably the boots on the ground as far as being able to recognize that this is happening. Uh, and so that's, I, I guess, it really important that we need to be working with Alberta education, government, whoever is responsible. But uh, I anticipate that this is going to become a demand, and I think it would be really important for us to make sure that we are speaking loud and clear to our partners, to our communities that, you know, we are reaching a point right now where we've got kids that need more education and we don't, aren't able to legally provide it for them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Go ahead, One please. brief follow-up too. Um, the, the other piece that we are working on is actually making sure people know uh, that those recently out students, those, those students that may need a course or two, uh, we're, we're getting access to those students and getting information to those students. And I would point to the, um, the satellite outreach campus at Paul first, or sorry, Duffield School for, um, you know, so there's a, some students that are in high school that, uh, you know, that may need access. And so getting to, to town, uh, might be a barrier. So that is an attempt to, to access, provide greater access for those students. And, and that is uh, some of the work we're doing right now. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Trustee Cameron, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the report. I appreciate that. Uh, I just want to talk about outreach. I do know that uh, we were going to to attempt, and it's listed here, an outreach uh, individualized uh, approach to help uh, at Duffield School. Is there any, can we just get a little update how that's going? I know it's something new, something we started just recently. Thank you, go ahead, please. So uh, the, the way the outreach uh, in uh, Satellite Campus at Duffield uh, is structured currently is there's one day a week and I'm going to say Tuesday, and I hope very good. It is Tuesday uh, that we are running. Um, it is it has started small, which was the intention. Um, uh, it is spreading through word of mouth. Um, the uh, there is a, a, a uh, an employee that is working out there and also working in conjunction with Memorial to increase um, a pass on that it's a, it's a it's a service that's available uh, where we saw and so it is growing and we we are now getting students working on a more regular basis or in a drop in basis but we did actually see one of the the fringe benefits was actually um, with some of the uh, uh, cold weather uh, icy road conditioned uh, days we actually saw a number of students that are not outreach students but registered at memorial that we're able to get for some assistance. So it, it is starting small. The intent is to grow it. Um, and so I don't have exact numbers, but we are starting to see on a regular basis. Uh, it is staffed uh, for the, the Tuesday and we're, we're starting to see students come. Um, our, our intention is to uh, uh, bring forward a full report after we've ran it for the year uh, to show the, the, the numbers to the board. Thank you very much. Superintendent Boyce, please. Just one tiny thing to add, uh, the space itself is a nice sized classroom space and so although there aren't very many students accessing it right now, we, we do have uh, capacity.
to grow it in that space. It's uh, beautifully situated right next to the door to make ease of access for, uh, for students who want to come into the program. So we're really excited about what, uh, what the future holds for it. Great, thank you very much. Just a follow, follow up, up, sorry, ahead, please. Yeah. Transportation for these, how do they get there? Uh, so if they're already a, um, a, a bust student, there is a sort of a mini transfer station at Duffield. So they would already get um, transportation to there. Uh, in some cases, if they're not a bust student, Duffield is much easier for private transportation to get to than, than it is Memorial or the, um, the high school outreach program. So, uh, so that, that is one of the ways that we're just trying to reduce a barrier there for sure. Good, thank you very much. Any other um, questions or comments before I go back to Trustee McCann? And I am seeing none. Okay, go ahead, please, Trustee McCann. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Trustee Cameron, I thought that's why you bought your truck. Please. Oh, okay. Um, I recognize that programs uh, are, are developed because we recognize a demand. And I think that that's part of the conversation we've, heard, we've seen today. But every time we develop a program, that means that we need to have resources for that. Uh, and, and I know that I'm not asking to identify uh, because that would probably be horrific if there were specific names, but are we also seeing that we are offering programs that are going to be dropping off because of the lack of demand? So things we've been doing in the past that no longer are required so that we can shift resources rather than be continually trying to add or trying to uh, overburden uh, people with more and more tasks to do. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'll go to Superintendent Boyce. I think that speaks to the evaluation and the review of the programs. Go ahead, please. So the beautiful thing about educators is that they're constantly looking for ways to change and to uh, adapt and to improve their program. So we've seen even um, informally programs shift over the last few years just to be more responsive uh, to students. And I think the move uh, to online learning is a very good example of that. We see that we saw a growing need. Uh, informally, teachers were adapting to it, and then we began to formally grow the program. Uh, there are always, we do an ongoing evaluation piece on every one of our programs. Uh, we try to see if they're growing or if they're decreasing or if they're kind of holding steady. And we evaluate um, the, the need versus the cost versus the accessibility and and it becomes a it, it absolutely so the, the short answer is yes uh the long answer is yes but it's really complex thank you very much okay seeing no other questions or comments i would just like to thank you very much for the information and the report very clearly presented and it just clearly also demonstrates the education programming options that are available in our school division for one quarter of our students, so 23%. So thank you very much for that. We'll move on to 8.3 off-campus report, page 24 of your package. Superintendent Boyce, please. Thank you. So as trustees would have uh, noticed from the previous report, obviously education doesn't always happen within uh, classrooms within within schools. Um, many of our programs uh, require community partnerships and access to facilities and organizations outside of Parkland School Division, uh, specifically high school programming. Um, uh, can be completed. Many of our students complete their high school programming uh, by accessing a number of off-campus providers. So to provide those details and the information around that, uh, you can use your table mic now, I think. Um, you, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Associate Superintendent Johnston and uh, Division Principal Bridgman again to talk about the um, off-campus programs. Thank you, Superintendent Boyce. Just um, very briefly, uh, uh, as indicated earlier, these are programs that, um, depending on enro enrollments, may change throughout the year. Um, these are off campus. And so uh, any of these programs are programs that would take a student out of the school uh, for, for various reasons and uh, are directly tied to um, uh, the world of work experiences that, um, that help students to then transition into uh, post-secondary trades or, or the world of work. 
Um, we we have a um, we have facilitation in this area. Um, we have a uh, a world of work. Uh, what's the role facilitator? <laughs> um, uh, who um, reports through to Division Principal Bridgman, um, and I think that there, there's some interest there in, in sharing how that program or how that facilitator works with respect to these programs. So Mike Partington, uh, good morning, everybody. Mike Partington is our facilitator that oversees these programs. And uh, I've had the privilege of watching him in his work with these kids uh, from getting kids signed up for the various work experience, um, green certificate program, and uh, the RAP program. And then he's working very closely with us with students that are interested in the, in the dual credit so his role is directly with students and the various community partners that allow for our students to be out in the community gaining these skills thank you Thanks, Quest Ed, any questions oh, sorry thank you questions trustee mccann please short and quick report thank you so much appreciate it um, I'm just looking at the uh, enrollment declines, work experience, building futures, green uh, certificate, obviously uh, the work experience is the biggest number. I'm making an assumption that this is because employees uh, were shy of taking students in given our health situation without trying to use that C word. Thank you, Thank you Trustee McCann. Uh, that definitely is a factor. Uh, the other factor, is these are year to date numbers uh, and we're anticipating growth as the school year continues. Thank you. Other questions or comments on the report? Trustee, Mc, uh, Trustee Cameron, please. Thank you very much. I, I'm just curious, you know, I've, I've heard dual credit many, many times. Can you give me just an example of, of what uh, one thing might be in a dual credit? Like, what would it be like? So, Trustee Cameron, that uh, dual credit is where they can earn credits from uh, one of the colleges or post-secondary institutions that we are affiliated with, that Park on School Division is affiliated with. So, uh, currently, we have agreements with Northern Lakes College, uh, Athabasca, Portage College, and Olds College. And so, students would be able to uh, be taking a post-secondary course while simultaneously getting the high school credit for that course. So you, the students are, are working under guidelines from another institution as well as our own? Yes. That's what, yeah, that's yeah. What, okay, good. thank you. Thank you, I'll turn it over to uh, Superintendent Boyce, please, did you have a comment? Uh, no, that's, I, that's exactly, I was just gonna help out Principal <laughs> Bridgman if she needed it. So yeah, that's exactly it. Um, it's, a, it's a program, that uh, ebbs and flows a bit because uh, there are lots of opportunities, uh, but, um, but sometimes it's a little more difficult to navigate than um, because you're working with two institutions, or, you know, Parkland School Division or any other school division and a post-secondary institution. But uh, I think we've made some uh, great strides in that in the last uh, two or three years for sure. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, just in terms of types of programs, currently we have um, students in um, like a nursing assistant program. Do, do we know uh, specifically what's? I, I didn't have it. Uh, I don't have that information in front of me, but I could certainly provide that for you. Thank you. Anything else? I do see Trustee Montgomery's hand, please. Go ahead, please. Thank you. I'm just wondering with the dual credit program, how the cost is allocated if they're doing, um, is there a cost to the student for the dual credit program? Thank you, Trustee Montgomery. For uh, dual credit, students would pay for their registration fees and their books, and the rest is covered under uh, Alberta Education. Sorry, they pay the registration fee for the post-secondary institution and their books. And then in terms of the rest, what? That's correct. The rest is covered off through Alberta Education. And in some, some cases, uh, there is grants 
and scholarships in the form of $1,000 to $2,000 uh, that would support a student receiving those programs. Perhaps I'm not understanding the registration fee. So if, if I'm a student in university attending a class, I'm paying registration fee and books. What other costs? What if, I, I must be not understanding something. Superintendent Boyce, please. Uh, so we enter into agreements with a number of post-secondary institutions and through those agreements, the cost allocation is figured out. Of course, post-secondary institutions have tuition fees uh, and, and in some cases, those tuition fees can be covered uh, by Alberta education grants that we would get as a, a partly from a student grant, in, but we generally wouldn't be able to pay for textbooks and things like that. So it's, and it'll vary a little bit between each uh, post-secondary institution. Uh, but yes, the short answer is there, generally speaking, would be additional costs to students for uh, enrolling in a dual credit program. Out of that, they, they get both credit at that post-secondary institution towards whatever certificate they're working towards and also high school credit. So they might get, let's say for argument's sake, 10 credits in high school programming, um, two or three courses or one or two courses towards that other uh, program that their diploma, whatever it is that they're working towards in that. Um, but there is a little bit of a cost to it, yeah. Does that answer Trustee Montgomery? Yes, okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay, seeing no other questions or comments, I would just like to thank you very much for the report. It's, um, it's information that's very helpful to us and again, extends education past the classroom. So thank you very much. Okay, I would like to move us on now, please, to item nine on the agenda, and that is trustee reports. And page 27 of your package, we will go to the benefit committee report. And um, Trustee Wagner, please, attended in my uh, absence. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the benefit committee met and voted for a new chair for the 2021-22 term. I'm just double checking that my mic's working. Yeah, okay, a little closer. Uh, the committee reviewed the January 2022 renewal report with Benefex, which outlined the negotiated rates for negotiated rates for basic life, accidental death and dismemberment, <clears throat> and long-term disability and dental and health rates. Uh, with the rates that increased were the health rates, dental rates, basic, uh, not basic life, accidental death and dismemberment, and long-term disability. All those rates increased, although there was a decrease in basic life insurance rates. The committee discussed out-of-Canada travel coverage and paramedical direct billing changes, um, which include a shift in the new system for direct submissions. Uh, no longer using the TELUS uh, system, but now there is a Sun Life uh, system that they have up and running themselves. So if uh, paramedical uh, are not signed up, if your paramedical specialists are not signed up with the new billing, you might uh, need to inform them that they need to switch over to get your submissions processed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, thank you. We'll move on to 9.2, please. And um, it shows Trustee Hennig, but I will ask Trustee Osborne, please, who was at the meeting to provide the report. Thank you. Yes, hello. Um, so on December 7th, uh, the COSC meeting was held virtually and covered the following topics. COSC members discussed updating, amending, or renewing the operating procedures for school councils. COSC members discussed uh, the provincial grant for school councils, which is $11,000 at $500 per school. Uh, ideas included hosting a school council and society development day to discuss topics such as school council improvement, Alberta school council resolutions, and other topics that are necessary to efficiently operate a school council. I was there and uh, reviewed some of the highlights from our November 20th um, board meeting. Um, 
Associate Superintendent Johnston discussed the government funding for the 22 Parkland School Division School Councils um, and what's allowable and not allowable for expenses. Um, Associate Superintendent Johnston also provided information regarding administrative procedures that are on the Parkland School Division website. Um, he also discussed the approval of the annual education results report. Um, additionally, that the AERR benefits from strong parent, strong, sorry, strong parent completion of the provincial assurance surveys sent out in February each year. Um, an update on the division's current progress in literacy and numeracy for grade two and three was also shared and discussed by COSC members. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Um, Trustee McCann has a question. Trustee Osborne. Thank you, Chair. And it's with respect to the funding that uh, has been provided to uh, school councils. Uh, you mentioned $11,000 in PSD. I'm um, just wondering if administration is aware, is, is that new money or is that money that's coming out of the pot of money that is just keeps having to be redistributed or is it coming right out of park plan school divisions budget Super, superintendent Boyce, please uh it's it's not coming out of our budget it's coming direct it's a grant from the alberta government yes yes, yes. Yeah. any follow-up to that um associate superintendent johnston uh, just that I know when the funding was initially announced, school councils had thought that that would be a great use for ASCA. There are uh, quite a list of things that they can and cannot use the funding for, and one of them is conference memberships. And so we had a pretty healthy conversation around uh, um, some ideas for that. The school councils don't receive the funding um, directly. Our school councils aren't designed to uh, process funding, um, whereas the societies are. Uh, we have that funding and so we're, we're going to continue to work with the council of school councils and the school council chairs uh, to figure out how to best leverage that uh, that uh, new eleven thousand dollars this year thank you very much any other questions for um trustee osborne trustee montgomery please yes thank you I, i'm just wondering i mean um with the 500 dollars per school council is it fairly simple administratively to um, to provide assistance to the school councils in terms of using the funds? I just I'm worried that there has been this um, perhaps good gesture uh, to school councils to to uh, you know assist them uh, through this program, but um, I'm I'm wondering about the administrative costs that aren't ever factored in. Is it is this pretty simple? And in terms of reporting back, are there reporting requirements that the division has to dedicate time to, um, with regards to these funds for each school council? Superintendent Boyce, please. Uh, generally speaking, yes, it's relatively simple. Of course, it is. Um, uh, work that didn't have to be done this time last year, for example, but. Um, but yeah, it's generally straightforward. I think it would be. I, I expect that there will be a need for a report, um, and we would uh, we would task COSC and or school council members in general to uh, or chairs in general to provide those reports back. Um, but uh, it it is uh, the guidelines for how to spend it are pretty straightforward, and so it's a matter of walking through with each individual. Thank you. Trustee Osborne, did you have any other comments or feedback on that particular question? And nothing to add, Chair. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We will move to 9.3, please. The Alberta School Boards Association report. Trustee Cameron and or Trustee Montgomery. I see Trustee Cameron's name is on the report, so I'll yeah. let you start, please. This is my month for the report, but I'm, I'm asking Trustee Montgomery to jump in at any time. I did give the report, but I want to highlight a few things on it. Uh, the Alberta Education always has a representative giving a report to the zone meetings, and uh, they, we get questions fired at them, and if they can't answer the question, they always say, we'll come back. It was interesting because there was a question, of course, uh, previously about uh, what's the government prepared to do with our insurance premiums concerns and whatever. And uh, the response back was that uh, they're aware of it and uh, that the increased transportation funding by 5% for the 2021-22 school year. So it was a rather disappointing response to that, but that's what we got. 
Uh, one question uh, I had asked previously was what were the guidelines for this school council engagement grant? Uh, and they came back and said it's the, the guidelines are found on page 104 and 105 of the funding manual, which I'm going to have to bend uh, uh, Associate Superintendent McFadden's ear on and then find out that. But uh, it, it's, and uh, as uh, Associate Superintendent uh, Johnston indicated, the school councils are responsible to school divisions, how they spend it. So that was uh, a good response to that. Uh, the other things I wanted to highlight is that we're really, really encouraged to uh, put uh, nominations forward for the Honoring Spirit uh, Award, and I hope that we're looking at that as a division for our Indigenous youth. Uh, there was a question, uh, what if the board refuses to implement the new curriculum next fall? I think some of that might be alleviated with the minister's announcement yesterday, but the answer was quite simple. We're legislated to do it and you would be breaking legislation if you chose not to. Uh, and the final thing was that there, there was a question brought up by Trustee Montgomery uh, about uh, why were we not able to view each board's votes at the fall FGM on the screen and they want to look into that and make sure that that is uh, uh, back on board for the spring uh, general meetings. So uh, Trustee Montgomery, if you have anything else to add, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Anything, Trustee Montgomery? I would just say that there was a discussion about uh, times when um, uh, members of the Alberta School Boards Association uh, meet with the Minister of Education. And, um, you know, the question of when two public uh, officials meet, how much of that information should be transparent and publicly available. And I'm not sure that we have come to um, a, a, a defined resolution with regards to that, but, um, you know, just so that we know that that is uh, ongoing discussions that we're having at that level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Superintendent Boyce, could you speak to the um, work that's done for the um, honoring um, the Spirit Award, please? Certainly. We uh, just received notice of that, I, I want to say, last week. Uh, there was an email that came uh, uh, regarding honoring Spirit uh, students, uh, so um, uh, nominating students for that honoring Spirit Award. Uh, we have now since sent that out to our school-based personnel and asked for and put it in our staff newsletter. Uh, and then that way that uh, we we are going to generate some nominations that way. Um, and uh, and then hopefully we, we've been successful with a number of nominations in the past few years. So um, we have some amazing students who do great work and uh, and uh, contribute in so many different ways. And so we're, we're excited to be able to um, most likely nominate a couple of students again this year. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions, any other questions for Trustee Cameron or Montgomery? Okay, thank you. Seeing none, we will move on to 9.4, which is Public School Boards Association of Alberta, and no meeting, no report. 9.5, Chamber of Commerce, the same thing, no meeting, no report. That moves us to item 10, future business. And um, I've asked uh, Trustee Hennig, please, to please read the meeting dates, 10.1. Thank you. Uh, so future meeting dates are uh, open to the public for January 18th, 2022. It's our regular board meeting that starts at 9 a.m. Uh, February 8th, 2022, regular board meeting, 9 a.m. as well, both of which are, uh, will be live streamed for the public. Uh, committee meetings, which are closed to the public, January 25th, 2022. It's our governance and planning session at 9 a.m. February 15th, 2022, it's the Teacher Board Advisory Committee, and it starts at uh, 4.15. February 18th, 2022, is the Governance and Planning Session at 9 a.m., and it's a full-day session. Committees that are closed to the public, uh, February 1st, 2022, Councils of School Council Meetings at 7 p.m., and that one will be held virtual. Thank you very much. If there's any conflict with any of those dates, please let us know. Thank you. 
Welcome to notice of motion. Is there a notice of motion? Seeing none, 10.3, topics for future agendas. Any topics for future agendas? Seeing none, 10.4, requests for information. Are there any requests for information? Thank you. Seeing none, there is no 10.5. There are no responses to requests for information. We did not have requests for information. Uh, move on to 11 in camera. We're not showing camera. So 12, there is no action. Oh, sorry, Trustee McCann. Go ahead, please. Uh, Chair, I was just wondering if you might grant me a little bit of latitude for a moment. Uh, yes. Great. So in response to an earlier comment made by colleague Montgomery, as a trustee, I hope you might agree that if I could decree that the bourgeoisie could never foresee that a devotee would advertise on a marquee that a person who is completely free, whether it is me, he, she, or we, would always choose to ever be at PSD. Thank you, Chair. Bravo, thank you very much. Thank you. And on that note, we will wish everyone um, a very warm winter break. And I would like to adjourn us at 11, 11 a.m. Please, thank you very much. <laughs>